wild. That's a 10 X in nine years. That's, that's yeah. good. That's good growth. That's, that's a huge mistake. accomplishment. Yeah. That's uh there's a lot of, that's a 10 X, not a two X. Uh, and, um, that puts you in a completely different magnitude of problems, right? Mm -hmm. More money, more problems. So, um, you know, uh, what I, when I was kind of listening to you, one of the things that I kind of thought about was it wasn't always the plan for you you got kind of sucked in, right? Have you ever wondered how successful architecture, engineering, and construction companies scale their business? Or have you ever wanted guidance on how to get more growth, wealth, and freedom from your AEC company? Well, then you're in luck. Hi, I'm Will Forat. And I'm Justin Nagel, and we're your podcast hosts. We interview successful AEC business leaders to learn how they use people, process, and technology to scale their businesses. So sit back and get ready to learn from the industry's best. This is Building Scale. Hey listeners, it's Will here. Our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. If you've ever listened to our show, then you know that the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. So if you suspect technology is your weak link, then book a call with us to see where we can help maximize your company's IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. Today's guest is Danielle Puente, Arizona native, licensed CPA, and a degree from University of Arizona. Danielle started as a public accountant at KPMG, joined DP Electric as a controller in 2015, and then moved into the CFO role in 2018. Promoted to president just last year in 2023, which is awesome, which uh, we love. And uh, her role at DP Electric uh, is to drive planning, uh, strategic planning and company culture with the main responsibility of growing shareholder value for her 800 employee owners in Arizona and Texas. Uh, DP Electric is a leading full service commercial electrical contracting firm in the Southwest that was founded in 1990 by her father, Daniel. They are known for large complex projects in mission critical aviation, healthcare, industrial, and commercial sectors. And in 2023, as they, uh, as I mentioned, they expanded to Texas, uh, and they are a hundred percent employee owned company and offer a training and development, um, whole program that we're going to talk a whole bunch about called DP university, um, and are consistently recognized as a top place to work. Um, all this was great and wonderful, Danielle. Everything was perfect, but you went to U of A, and as a Sun Devil, it hurts my soul. Uh, but with all that said, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Will and Justin. I really appreciate it. Congrats on um, all the success of your podcast, and I'm honored to be a part of it. Oh, thank well, you so much. We love thank that. Thank you. Uh, we love bringing it. You know, we like, uh, we have a good eye for uh, people that are up and coming or have decide to stay in the background for their own reasons. And then we like to bring them to the foreground. So, and we like your story. So, uh, and I think uh, our audience and our listeners will definitely uh, like to hear what you're all about. I think it's unique. Um, so let's get, why don't we get started? Yeah. So uh, I said a lot of fun stuff, but tell us, tell us your origin story, Danielle. Tell us uh, how you got into the business and then just tell us a little bit about DP. Yeah, of course. Um, so I guess starting with the story of DP Electric, it was founded in 1990 by my father, Dan Puente. Uh, my father, he did not go to college, um, went to high school, got a job as a material hand um, supplier, right, at a school, learned how to become an electrician, uh, worked for some different employers in Arizona, and was just a more reserved, shy person, um, felt like he was often overlooked for opportunity um, and really felt like he could build a better company, right? And at the time, um, he had been married for a few years and my mom really supported him in his dream to go off on his own. So we always say like it started out of his garage with, ju with just him and a few other employees and has really taken off since then. Um, and really his brand was falling through on commitments, doing the right thing. And a lot of the growth has been organic. Um, so I, 
obviously grew around the business, going to company picnics and different things. Um, I studied accounting and entrepreneurship, and the entrepreneurship side really came from, um, you know, my dad's story and him being an inspiration to me, um, but still thought I would do my own thing, um, never thought I would really end up in the family business. So after college, I did public accounting, and nine years ago, the controller at DP had left, and it was a great, you know, accounting opportunity for me. So um, it was definitely meant to be because my father was looking for somebody for, I think, five months, offered the position to multiple people that they fell through, and it took me that long to really wrap my head around it, but I finally was like, I'll give it a shot. And um, just really loved um, construction. It's definitely um, a unique industry. And um, it's been an evolution. I guess my journey started learning, you know, the finance side of the business. Um, in the beginning, I really focused on culture, hired a great HR leader, um, really invested in that. And then, like you said, and um, took on that CFO role as we grew. Um, when I started, we were about a $30 million contractor. When I was promoted to CFO, we were at about $60 million um, in about three years. And that was a turning point for me because I was really focused more on operations and more aspects of the high-level um, parts of our business. And... You know, around that time, we formed a leadership team that I was running, first long-term strategic plan, um, and really over the last three to five years, um, partially the market of Arizona booming right now, and also just some great leaders in our organization that helped us scale. But today, um, I, I'm in the president role. Um, we're on track to do close to 300 million this year with 800 people. Um, and yeah, Dan is, he says he's semi-retired. My father, he's still, um, you know, in, still somewhat engaged with the business, but just gets to enjoy the relationships um, and the industry part and really um, letting the team run the day to day. So that's kind of a snapshot of the story, um, but it's been, yeah, a great um, nine years. And yeah, we've accomplished a lot <laughs> in that that's time. That's wild. That's a 10 X in nine years. That's, that's yeah. good. That's good growth. That's, that's a huge insane. accomplishment. Yeah. That's uh there's a lot of, that's a 10 X, not a two X. Uh, and um, that puts you in a completely different magnitude of problems, right? Mm -hmm. More money, more problems. So, um, you know, uh, what I when I was kind of listening to you, one of the things that I kind of thought about was it wasn't always the plan for you, and you got kind of sucked in, right? And uh, I've I've de we've definitely interviewed a bunch of people that had or have family businesses, and it's either I really like it or I really hate it, right? Or hated it if they finally moved uh, moved away. Um, and one of the re reoccurring themes that I heard, uh, is especially in family partnerships where the family is running the business is whether or not, um, sort of the, the parents can let go of the bind or are they still meddling in the business, right? What does that look like inside of DP? Yeah. Um, you know, similar to you, I've heard a lot of, um, multi-generational stories, right? Um, have a lot of great um, relationships with individuals so, can, so you can really bond over that. Um, I would say our story is unique in the sense that, um, you know, a lot of times with that multi-generational transition, you kind of have that old school mentality versus like new school um, sometimes. And I think Dan was always a little bit more of that new school, even before other people started trending that way, right? He was always big on, you know, putting your people first, investing in training, 
um, and, you know, investing in different things that were going to create a better work environment for our team. And so we actually think surprisingly similarly. And it wasn't until I started working in the business that I realized how similar our decision making and our vision was. Um, so that really helped with, you know, um, the potential conflict <laughs> that happens. And I think because he was a progressive person, he realized that, you know, eventually I would like to retire and this business needs to function without me. And so the fact that, you know, five years ago, he recognized the need to transition that decision making to a leadership team um, was very forward thinking and helped the business, right? We wouldn't have been able to grow if it was just one person that was holding on, <laughs> right, and restricting it. Um and so I give him so much credit for really just pouring into the team and building leaders, especially with myself. Um, and a big part of that is as I took on more responsibility and made decisions, um, he supported it, right? So it wasn't that good cop, bad cop thing <laughs> of um, dif different decision makers. Um, and granted, it's still like anything where it's a roller coaster. I mean, my dad, he's a founder. It's his baby. Um, he built it. So for somebody like that to come in and not have a bunch of meetings or not have a bunch of emails or decisions they need to make, um, it's still a hard transition. It's difficult. It's about finding other purposes and other things, right? Um, and thank God for my mom, because she is like, <laughs> she's like, come on, we got to do other things outside of the business and is supportive of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's ups and downs. Um, Dan kind of says it's like his kids graduating, you know, from high school or college. It's like, you're so proud and then there's also a piece of you that's like, oh, it's kind of sad too, right? Um, but overall, could not be more happy with the team that we have and my leadership. So, um, no, it's really, um, yeah, it's been a very good dynamic, um, surprisingly, because I know the challenges <laughs> that could, uh -huh. could occur, right? Well, yeah. Well, thank you for thank you for sharing that. So obviously, this is a good representation of what it what it can look like when it's a good family uh, partnership. I have mm -hmm. a personal horror story that I will not talk about uh, <laughs> on this episode, but I have the opposite uh, example of what you what you portray. So good for you, and good for your yeah. dad for uh, being able to let go and you know and trust that you're able to run it. You're able to align vision and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so super cool to hear that. Um, so, you know, you talked a little bit about culture. Uh, I think this is a good place to talk about this for a second. Um, there's a fear around losing people, right? So they might be, you know, they'll do the work, but then if you lose the, lose the people terminate, or they just part ways from you. Versus uh, and versus uh, keeping them right, and because there's a shortage, there's a labor shortage that's out there. How do you weigh culture? You know, people in the right right seat, right people, right seat versus the fear of losing people. What do you? How do you make a decision around that? Yeah, um, I think you know our core philosophy is you know, you invest in your team, um, you give them opportunity, you pour into them, and then all of the things that people would label as success from a business standpoint comes from that, right? Like, if you have great people, it means your clients are going to want to partner with you on that next opportunity, which means, I mean, my background is finance, so I'm all about making money. <laughs> and if we don't, we can't, we can't um, do things that make, you know, our company a great culture, right? 
But what we found is that they're very interrelated. The more we invest in our team, the more the revenue and the profits start to grow, which helps us reinvest it, right? And make our culture even better. And it's kind of this um, cycle. And it's really just, it's one of like our core beliefs to the point that I don't, and the team doesn't really question it. So we don't hesitate as much if it makes sense from a culture and a people standpoint to spend the money. And because we've seen it, we've seen it pay off time and time again. Um, and so I wouldn't say that fear necessarily of losing people or we're going to be out um, this money we're investing is something we think about very often because it always comes back, you know, twofold. If that's the when did you... question. <laughs> It did, in part. Justin asked your question. I think. Yeah. When did you, you come to that realization? Because you, as you admitted, you're a finance person. You are a money person. So, like a lot of times when we think of people uh, side of that and culture side of that, not that they should be viewed as opposing forces, because that's untrue. Is is certainly what you've seen. But there is a uh, a thought process, a mindset of like dollars. How do you make more dollars? How do you find the the places where the money's at? And like what you're doing for people, how you're investing in people, because it's hard, you know, at least a lot of leaders find it hard to like, well, here is my people metrics and that people metrics shows me this ROI. Mm -hmm. So there's a quantification, so there's a quantification problem. Yeah. Right? So Quantifying when did you discover this? Uh, oh yeah. Let's take care of our people to the greatest extent. And then boom, the, the money falls out the other end. Right. Um, I think it's something, you know, my father, Dan, also learned it in his journey. He said there was a turning point for him where, um, especially when you're building it from nothing, you know, he was trying to see when it came to adding people, like who were the cheapest people <laughs> he could find, <laughs> right? Because um, that was going to make the most sense, right? And that was going to save him money. And then there was a turning point where he's like, oh, maybe if I just spend a little bit more, I'm going to get a better quality individual, right? And then my life is so much easier, right? And I have less problems, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm making more money. So I think that base philosophy was there when I started. And I will yeah. say that um, as our business has grown, when I look back nine years from now, I would say we started on a small scale. Like when I joined at DP, something we implemented um, pretty early on was like DP De Niro. Um, and it was just a reward system where we would tell people we appreciate them and they would get like a little gift card, right? And in the grand scheme of things, we weren't spending a lot of money on it, mm -hmm. um, on these different initiatives. Um, but those little things really helped with retention, right? And helped um, in other aspects. Um, and then flash forward to today, um, we are a much larger organization. So the dollars we're spending on, you know, our wellness program and our training, I mean, nine years ago, we wouldn't have even thought, right, of having those types of line items in our budget. Um, so, you know, it just depends at what point in the business you're at and what you can afford to do. But I think starting small and seeing the outcome kind of, like I said, it helps you um, reaffirm that, that it works, right? I don't have, yeah. even though I'm a finance person, I don't have some great formula for you of, you know, this is how I figured out the math of it working. Um, but it's just something that you feel and you see and you know that you're on the right track, I guess. If you would have been able to break out the whiteboard and school us in that, here's the formula, you, you'd be a gazillionaire, I feel like. <laughs> that is like the mystery of mysteries. If you can prove this... Uh, via formula, it becomes like unbelievable. Um, you, you mentioned uh, you had to build a leadership team. This was a thing that didn't exist initially. What does creating a leadership team look like? What I feel like a lot of people talk about, oh, we have a leadership team. And maybe it was just people that have been here for a while. And like, we kind of, you know, it, it kind of gets built in all kinds of ways. But you being very intentional, 
you know, coming in as a controller, CFO, then the president, like, how did, how did you create that leadership team? What did that look like um, building it? And, and why is it so effective? I mean, to start um, four or five years ago, it did start with, you know, my dad, my father, Dan's vision, right, of what could this look like? At that stage, I was confident that I wanted to be his successor, and he also um, believed in that path. And so his vision was, let's surround um, Danielle with a great group of people, right? So some of it was, you know, culture and values and character and that piece of it. But then another part of selecting it was just making sure all assets of our company were represented, right? Operations, HR, our field, um, pre-con. Um, obviously, I had the finance side, um, but now have a great CFO. Um, so just making sure that we had, from a responsibility standpoint, everybody. Um, one thing that really helped us. Like I said, it wasn't until five years ago that we had a long-term strategic plan. We really didn't um, have anything on paper of where we were going. And so the tool that we use is um, Traction or EOS, right, for that strategic planning. And yeah, I know a lot of people, yeah, EOS looks behind you well. Um, but that gave us a framework and there's a lot of tools even within EOS on building a healthy leadership team, right? What are those things you have to do to build trust and make sure you're talking about the right things in your business? Um, and it takes time. I mean, you know, we're much stronger than we were five years ago, but I mean, there's moments where we're still figuring each other out, right? <laughs> um, and but that's really the tools that we used and it started with Dan's vision. And I'm sure 10 years from now, it will evolve just like the business needs to evolve. Right. Um, and that's what, where we're at is we're really trying to figure out a mechanism to engage, you know, other up and coming leaders in our strategic plan. How do we get buy-in outside of just a group of six or seven people? How do you get buy-in from a larger um, team so that everybody's pulling in that same direction. And those are some things more recently we've been focused on as you get bigger, right? Yeah, so I just I actually finished uh, People, a new EOS uh, or newer EOS book that, that came out. Um, so uh, it's, it's, for me, it's having a system, right? You have a system you go to to say, hey, like this is how we solve our problems. So we put it on the issues list. We have our level 10s. We do all those things. Um, it, it, for me, a business that doesn't have some form of system that is chaos. Like it's just, it doesn't make any sense. How can you get to 800 people if there's no plan? I mean, it, it's actually baffling, uh, you know, as I hear this, I'm like, oh my goodness, it, it was five years ago that you threw something down and you were already so large, like at that point, like, it's like so impressive and kind of goes to the point of people, right? When you find the right people and you care about your people, you can do unbelievable things. So I got a question because EOS, uh, there's the uh, VI relationship. For those that are not familiar, it's the visionary integrator relationship. Okay, so when you first started, you were much more in an operations role. Controller, uh, you know, accounting, uh, CFO, those are much more uh, on the operations side. And then now actually helping lead the company, are you? would you consider yourself a visionary? or an implementer, or both? Yeah, that's a good question. Because um, you're right, when we first started, I was definitely more of the integrator and Dan was the visionary. And then um, more recently, because it's only been in the last year that I have um, been in the president role and now have a CFO. So I would say that we're still in transition. My CFO is a great integrator. And for me, it's a matter of getting out of my old habits of being a detailed person because <laughs> um, they are kind of two different mindsets. Um, so I would say I'm a little bit of both, but I have been spending more time on vision. I mean, a lot of my role now um, 
is the company communication, right? Getting everybody um, on our team to know what's going on, where we're going. We have quarterly town halls. Um, and with EOS, you know, you have your three-year picture, right? And so um, I just finished that and we're um, going to be sharing that with the team too. Um, so nice. spending more time there, but it is a transition for sure um, of a different skill set and different um, mindset that um, kind of working on. <laughs> We're going to have uh, to get Will out here and you can uh, shadow him for a couple of days and see how uh, many ideas one can have in a, in a hour. Uh, it's kind of baffling. Uh. <laughs> uh, the, the litmus test here uh, to understand whether or not, you know, where you're at on the visionary scale or how far over you are on the visionary scale is how many times your integrator says no to you in an hour or in a day. Uh <laughs> That is the that is the true test of how uh, of where you're at in terms of visionary. Okay, so good. so the more times you are said no to, okay, uh, yes, there will be crazy ideas. Um, but it's the one in one in a hundred, one in a thousand that gets yes that's said yes to, and that actually helps move the company. Okay, mm -hmm. um, Justin. Uh, where would I? Where would you put me on that scale? Uh, just to yeah. give a litmus yeah. test. In easy, if we're in a we're a ninety minute meeting, we're in an L ten uh, ninety minutes. We're getting at least uh, twenty different ideas out of that meeting without question. That uh, our integrator has to say, "No, Will, that's not going to happen." <laughs> uh, but then again, Will's totally right. Like something hits, and then it's like, "Oh wow, we just opened up a gate that we had no idea was there, and it changes everything." Right? I mean, that's the beauty of a visionary. Um, so yeah, it's uh, and and you know, instilling that energy in, like, right. It's just like, you know, you mentioned communication, like, Hey, this is where we're going. This is our three year picture, all those different things. That, I don't know. That stuff excites me. Like I just get super amped up and excited. That's the, that's the thing that I love about um, a visionary that can really just paint that picture for like, look at the amazing stuff we're going to do. Um, and the belief that we are absolutely going to do it. It's not a, a, a wishy washy uh, dream. Right. Yeah, for sure. So speaking of, well, visionary, uh, uh, one of the things that you had mentioned in a, in a previous conversation was about the apprenticeship program. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea around it, uh, while in itself is not unique, but how you're going about it, I think is unique. Uh, and could you talk a little bit about that? Where did, you know, what, where did the idea start? How did you come about? kind of, and what did you do to sort of implement uh, that idea and yeah. what you're even building uh, on top of that? Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, most electrical contractors will offer an apprenticeship program and they'll sponsor it, right? So, um, and that's what we were doing for most of DP's um, history. We were using a third party um, paying for apprentices to go to that school. Um, and it was in 2020 um, where we decided to essentially bring that program in-house, right, and not outsource it. And the reason behind that was, um, one, it fits our culture, right, of where we're going to spend our time and money. Um the program we were outsourcing to, it was two days a week from six o'clock at night to eight o'clock at night. Um, we had a vision that, you know, our program would be one day a week from three to 6.30. Um, we bring in dinner for them every night. Um, we had a vision for more hands-on training. Um, and really, if you think about an apprenticeship program, it's a four-year program where they are um, working during the day, and then they're going to school in the evening. Um, the, as the employer, we're sponsoring it, we're paying for the, the cost of the program. Um, but it's really building our future workforce, right? And how do we want to mold them? And um, we got our program accredited through the NCCER. So it's um, accredited curriculum that we're following. We also have the opportunity to build in 
you know, our expectations at DP, our core values, um, really mold our future workforce, how we, how we see it. Right. Um, and we have a lot of individuals that have a passion for giving back and educating. Um, so all of our instructors are, um, they're foremen, um, they're project managers, they are our team members. Um, that are training our team. So it really builds like that sense of community right out of the gate. Um, and so that's really what started it. It was one of our superintendents that had that passion that really brought the idea to our executive team. And then we supported it. Um, so we got it accredited. It's um, recognized by the Department of Labor as, um, you know, our apprenticeship program recognized by the state. And so that's where it was born. Um, and, you know, it's evolved over time. I think in the beginning we had maybe like 60 apprentices. So we were just doing it out of our office space in Tempe, but quickly kind of outgrew our training room. So a couple years ago, the building across the street um, came up for sale and we wanted a dedicated training space. Um, so we today have a 20,000 square foot training center for DP University. It has two large classrooms. It has a large hands-on training lab that basically looks like a mock job site um, where a team can go um, and get some, you know, real experience like they would on the job. Um, and then outside of that, of course, it's got you know, a gym, showers, it looks like a campus, it's got a basketball court inside. Um, so we really wanted to have a space that our apprentices felt like was their space. Um, and, you know, it is, um, I, th I think since we've done it, <laughs> brought it in house in 2020, there are more ECs that are really kind of following that model. I think that, you know, our program and what we're offering is at another level as far as just um, the overall experience, right? Um, but today we have 150 apprentices in the program. Um, every night we have, you know, two classes going every evening. We have eight instructors. So it is a big um, operation, um, but really just kind of fit our model um, and helps us build our workforce. So our vision with this program is that, you know, every year we graduate about 50 or 60 new journeymen um, to our um, workforce. And, you know, every year over the course of the year, we're adding 50 or 60 new um, individuals that are completely new to construction. And then we get to mold them um, where we've, um, that's the ideal scenario, and that's where we're going. But obviously, when you grow, you need experienced talent too, right? So we're also hiring people um, that are coming from maybe other companies um, that are journeymen or even apprentices that are joining our team, and we have to train those individuals as well. So we're also offering a lot of continuing education um, and we have three full-time craft trainers, too, <laughs> that are helping us with that. Um, so it is um, just a big, big operation, but really it's building our future workforce. And our reputation is how we perform on the job at the end of the day. So we need qualified, trained individuals that represent our company at the end of the day. And that's how we're doing it. So, you know, just a tiny bit of money invested in, in the training program, the facilities right. and the thought process and the people behind it. Just just a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's great. It's wonderful to hear. Uh, uh, you know, I'm curious uh, when it comes to the investment of people. Um, how does it come back to you? Uh, like, let's say in retention. Yeah. Um, so we, we do track retention. And what we found is really after the first year, our retention is about 80%. Um, 
So when we have somebody for a year, the vast majority of that group stay with us a long time. Um, and, you know, as far as that first year, a lot of it is, you know, that individual determining, is this the long-term career I want? Or sometimes we run into, you know, attendance issues and those sorts of things. So one thing we're looking into and we're at the early stages is more recently, there's a lot more um, organizations that are offering pre-apprenticeship. So it's almost like a, you know, its own screening program of finding the individuals that really are invested in this career path um, and vetting them so that, you know, maybe even in the first year, we see that retention rate right off, right out of the gates, right? Because we're getting the right people funneled in, right? So that's a newer thing that um, different colleges are offering. Um, we're also seeing in high schools just a lot more focus on the trades again, right? Where people, um, high schools are bringing back um, those different offerings. Um, so also just, we could probably do a better job of getting the right people in that are already engaged, right? With the career path. Um, but yeah, what we find is when somebody's here a year, um, they typically are a, um, a lifelong employee. Um, and the apprenticeship program helps we don't have the data on that yet, um, but my gut is that it's going to help with retention because, like I said, it's building that sense of community. They're invested. They want to graduate. They have a group of peers that they're going to school with. Um, and so and now with the ESOP, um, we, you know, that is vested over six years, um, but the people that stay are also going to start to see their retirement dollars grow too. So there's, um, it's the training and the program, but it's also just our benefit structure of really rewarding people that stay long-term with us. That's wonderful. Uh, I love hearing kind of the thought process behind this and there are metrics right in the background. Mm -hmm. There are metrics be that are being looked at, uh, measured or know that we need to measure them just figuring out a good way to get to that end point. Super cool mm -hmm. to hear, you know, the thinking behind, you know, where a company your size is looking at strategically. So super great to hear. Love that. So that very much is uh, through the apprentice program. What about when you're, you're hiring somebody that is much more senior, somebody that's in a superintendent level or, or a leadership level? Like what is, how do you vet them to get them to to buy into the culture and, and really be uh, somebody that's going to be a lifelong uh, member of the team? Yeah. Um, so on the hiring side, we actually have three full time recruiters um, and they go through a three step process. One is a code knowledge test, right, for the more mm -hmm. experienced hires. And then they also do a hands on test in our lab. Um, that is more focused on like hard skills and pipe bending, and then they do a sit down interview. So we do spend, you know, about three hours in person with each candidate, um, and doing our best to vet them that way. Um, I will say until they're fully on the job, um, that's really when you get to know, you know, somebody's drive and their knowledge. And so what we've started implementing more recently is, um, you know, an assessment process for those individuals um, that are new to our team. That's a deeper dive in where their knowledge is and then pairing trainings with them um, on what they might be deficient in, right? Like, I think it was a shift for us is, you know, we'd hire people that would say they're at a certain level. Um, we would send them to the job and then usually our field leaders would be frustrated, right? They'd be like, oh, this person doesn't know enough. They say they're a journeyman, they're not. Um, and then our hiring team would be like, well, that's who's out in the marketplace right now. This is the best you're going to get, right? And you got to figure out how to mentor them and get them up to speed. And 
we've really shifted over the last couple years of yes, you know, as leaders, we're relying on you to mentor the team, get them up to our DP standard. And from a headquarters standpoint, um, let's also do our part, right? Let's get them into our lab. Um, let's get them into the classroom if um, they are deficient in a certain area. So let's shore them up on our end. Um, and that's why now we have three full-time trainers because um, we are getting people um, through our Deep University um, Center a lot more frequently to do that. So I, I am curious, um, you know, someone coming in saying that they're at a certain level and then when they actually go out into the field, they're not quite to the standard you're looking for uh, at that level. So um, totally your opinion. Um, would you say this is more of an awareness problem for the individual or is this the company not communicating what the job is about or something else? Where's the, where's the disconnect? Yeah. One challenge we have in Arizona is we are not a licensed state, meaning that, um, if somebody has been working out at jobs as an electrician for 15 years, they can say that they're a journeyman. They do not have to have any formal education in a classroom setting. Um, and so what ends up happening is the talent pool out there, um, depending on where they were, what background, um, they might have not gone through a formal apprenticeship program. They may have not been offered those training programs. They might be great um, as like mechanically inclined and a hard worker, um, but, you know, like I said, I think DP is offering a top-notch training and resources. Um, a lot of individuals coming through the door have not received that, right? And so um, instead of saying, oh, well, you haven't gone through any training or formal apprenticeship program, we're not going to hire you um, because we have a labor shortage, uh, and we're growing, it's like, okay, let's get you in the door and let's give you the training that you need um, so that um, you can't be up to, to our standard, right? Okay. Investing in those people, um, even if they've been in the industry for 15 plus years, mm -hmm. that makes total sense. Yeah. So uh, I want to switch gears for a second because we heard a lot about your process, uh, definitely about other people. Um, before, actually, before we switch gears, um, do you do, because you do assessments, um, what about the personality side? Do you do any type of personality uh, assessments? Not just technical, right? But then the personality side? Um, for office positions, we use predictive index. Um, on the field side, we do not do any of that. Um, I would say for leadership um, positions, we're offering more like soft skill leadership training now, right? Because um, when you get to a certain level, it's about communication and empowering your team. And so we do offer um, those classes as well. Um, so I would say the, the assessments are on the personality side are just more for um, office hiring that we're doing. Okay. Um, predictive in index, uh, just to give a high, a high level uh, aspect of what that actually um, is. Can you talk a little bit about what you're actually, what does the personality test try to achieve or what would you get out of it? Yeah, um, so it's really a summary of how that person shows up in the workplace and how they perceive themselves, right? And it kind of gives a snapshot of, um, you know, their management style, um, you know, how they want to be led. And I think it just better prepares, you know, the team when they're coming on board, um, and in the interview process also helps just make sure we're asking the right questions and finding the right people for the right seat. Um, and it's really just another piece of information or data when it comes to that decision-making process. 
Um, we are not, I know some companies are like, oh, if you don't fit this profile for this position where that's a hard no, um, we more just look at it as another data point versus like being super strict with it. Um, and yeah, so it is helpful. Um, we, I know some companies go like all in on it, I would say <laughs> we're just kind of um, getting started with it. Well, I appreciate uh, a little bit of the description. It's different from your typical disk profiles uh, that mm -hmm. are used in the industry. So I love kind of hearing about that, especially since you're only using it more for the office people, not so much for the uh, for the field. Uh, it's also uh, interesting and unique. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so uh, when the company first started, technology in the world looked a little different, a little a lot. Um, Fast forward to today, you know, how is your, how have you and how's your company evolved in terms of making decisions around new technology, whether or not you should implement or not, uh, whether or not you should uh, invest or not? Uh, how has the thinking evolved? Yeah, um, it's definitely evolved because when I started at DP, we had like our servers in our closet that would always overheat and our purchasing manager would pull it <laughs> Is. Um, you know, so today, obviously, everything's on the cloud. We utilize a lot of softwares. I feel like there's a software solution for everything these days. Oh, yeah. um, and I would say it's really only been in the last year or so that we've um, <laughs> We've invested more as far as we do have a bigger team um, in IT. And I think our vision with it, which like I said, now that we have the staffing and the resources for it to focus on is really two things. One is, you know, data. So we have so much data. We have an ERP system, um, but we're not using it. Right. And so how do we leverage that to make better decisions and work smarter? And then the second piece is automation. So the vision is that, you know, flash forward years from now, that manual data entry goes away. Right. And um, what that's going to allow us to do, since we're a very growth minded business, it's not to cut jobs. Right. It's actually to help us as we scale. Um, you know, maybe we don't, if we double in size, maybe we don't, we don't need to double these departments, right? Which in turn, if we're more efficient, makes the ESOP more valuable, right? Which the people that are here are going to benefit from that. Um, and so that is, um, a vision for us over the next couple of years, but I would say it's, it's more like in the last year, that I think we're set up to really focus on that. And I would, you know, in a few years from now, I could check in and probably my goal is I'd have all these amazing stories to tell you of all the things that we did and automated, but we're more at the early stages. And I know construction is like, you know, I think we have the stats for the lowest spend in IT, right? Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Very prevalent in the industry because uh, the old guard, the old, gen the older generation, people like your father, and I'm not saying it was your father specifically. However, the mentality of it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. And looking at technology as more of a cost rather than an investment. Right. It's a complete mm -hmm. mindset thing. Uh, and uh, even like where the role of, let's say, so just we'll use IT as an example. Uh, since you brought it up, right? It, old school thinking is that IT is an administrative cost, therefore it falls under the CFO role. Where, uh, whereas new school of thought for IT is that it falls under the COO because it's a productivity enhancer, right? Very different schools of thought and how it's uh, looked at in terms of on the P&L and on, uh, on the balance sheet, very different uh, types of uh, schools of thought around cost for cost control, right? CFO right. cost control for versus COO is very much if I invest more in this, will I get more back in my business, right? And that's that's kind of the newer school of thought. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you have metrics or ways that you can evaluate this? I'm not even saying IT, just in general, right? Uh, do you have uh, 
things that you try to measure up against is your data. That's a big journey. I'm just going to say straight straight up, there's a lot of data uh, in uh, in the industry, uh, a lot of ma manual entry. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, making sure that you have a single source of truth, making sure that who should have access does have access. Um, and I don't know if you have dabbled in this yet or not, but this is the beginning stages of actually beginning your AI journey mm -hmm. um, to, and uh, there's a lot of talk uh, uh, in the industry around AI, but that doesn't mean that it's all useful in terms right. of data. Can you speak to a little bit about that? Um, what, what you've seen, uh, mm -hmm. so maybe even uh, by all means, feel free to be a little visionary here okay. and uh, uh, talk to us about what you see and how that affects what you're doing today. And, in the near future, next year, three years, five years? Yeah, I think on the ROI question that we more assess on like um, project by project, you know, um, situation or if we're going to invest in software, whatever that project is. Um, I think, you know, looking forward, um, I would say, you know, I'm in a peer group with other CEOs and presidents that are not part of construction, right, that are in other industries and just learning from them and really admiring what they've been able to accomplish, right? Um, because we're such at the early stages, it's like, okay, um, even if it's a different industry, what have other leaders or companies done with AI or automation? and what's been successful for them and how could that relate to DP, right? And okay. that's, um, I think where, where I am today is really just, um, you know, wrapping my head around what's been successful, right? For other okay. companies, because there are, um, I just know I see the stories and the other organizations that are ahead of us in this respect, right? Um, and it's being aware of it and um, open and uh, figuring out what we can prioritize first, right? So what about things like uh, cybersecurity where it doesn't give you a direct return, right? Spending a dollar in cybersecurity doesn't give you a dollar or more back. Mm -hmm. um, how do you make investments uh, in something like that, right? It's digital safety. Safety is another example of that. How do you make investments in that or how do you justify costs in something like that? Right. Um, just go to a few seminars and get scared to death about how. <laughs> <laughs> well, that wasn't the direction that I thought this was going to go, but I, I understand uh, something that I dislike about. Will likes to you. Will likes to put on those seminars. Uh, that's he likes right. to make people uh, palpitate a little bit. Uh. Yeah. No. I mean, I think when it comes to that stuff, it's really. Um, being educated on what those risks are, right? And it is some really terrifying things. Um, and so, you know, um, it's about, we are partnered with a great third party, you know, IT company that is that consulting and that guidance of, you know, at, at our size, um, what we should be considering and listening <laughs> and taking those things into consideration. Um, especially as you get larger, um, nobody wants to end up, you know, in the newspaper or it's, um, it's just, it's the cost of doing business, almost like, um, you know, insurance, right? I mean, everybody needs the right protection. And I think on the IT side, it's the same thing. There are certain things you don't want to cut corners on um, because you, we got to protect what we built, right? And, um, that is a huge risk right now. So I'm, I don't shy away from that because that stuff scares me. <laughs> uh, not the direction that we like to go in terms of scaring people. We like to educate people on that stuff, right? And it's really about uh, smaller businesses uh, in the industry don't necessarily have this vocabulary, but it's about risk management, risk and liability mm -hmm. uh, management. Um, and it's terminology we could tell the difference in companies that have grown up a bit and matured in their thinking and processes when they start using words like that. Uh, it's definitely a litmus test, if you will, in seeing whether or not 
they've gotten to the next stage and how they consider these uh, uh, these decisions, right? It, what's the difference between a $15 helmet and a $150 helmet, right? right. Mm -hmm. They're helmets, but then there's a risk aspect to it as well. So, yeah. um, no, thank you for uh, kind of getting a little bit of thinking and inner workings on someone your size and how you think about these, these type of things. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin, I think it's time for our last question. You want to absolutely carry um, us on? Yeah, no. So we love to ask this question uh, and we're going to ask it to you. So Danielle, if you could go back 20 years, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, um, I would say, I think the advice I would give myself is just, um, you know, to trust my gut, right? And to um, speak up about the things that I believe in. I mean, I I do that more often today than I did as a younger person. Um, but man, like when you learn that early, um, it just, I think, um, helps you on your path even quicker. I mean, I, my path has been pretty... <laughs> quick as it is. Um, but yeah, just that, um, that confidence in speaking up and that gut feeling, um, is it means something right. And I'm a very analytical person being like finance framed. Um, so just trusting that more, I think, um, is a good thing to learn as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's great. Actually, that's right wonderful. before you hopped on the call, Will was explaining that his two year old was very loud and yelling. And <laughs> I was trying to explain to him that he was just uh, speaking his mind and trusting his gut. So uh, no, very, very, very fitting uh, as in before the conversation started. So I love that. I, I think that people do need to just trust what they what what's inside a little bit more and then, you know, do something about it. It's, it's, <laughs> You only you only get so uh, far by knowing something, uh, right. but it's actually the doing or saying something that gets you all the way there. Right, it's action, right? And yeah. I think um, sometimes when you spend too much time <laughs> thinking about something, or um, it can slow slow you down, right? So it's just something I try to remind myself today. I think the yeah. term that I heard about this one, is, I think it's called analysis paralysis. Right. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure someone uh, someone is very interested in hearing that that feedback. So thank you for that. Yeah. You've been awesome. Uh, thank you for sharing your stories today. And uh, Justin, close us out. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, we're going to put all your social stuff in the show notes uh, and all those fun things. But if uh, somebody wanted to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, um, I mean, our website is dpelectric.com. Um, you can also find us on LinkedIn um, there. And yeah, happy to share my info if anybody reaches out. And cool. yeah, thank you guys so much for the time. It was a really great conversation and enjoyed getting to know you both better. So thank you. Awesome. We love that. Uh, this was great. You are super fantastic. And we can't wait to have another interview with you. Uh, you'd said, you know, in a few years, you'll have a whole oh, different yeah. uh, perspective in some of these initiatives that are happening. So we'll, we'll love to do the, the follow up there. Um, listeners, I hope you had just as good time as me and Will did. Uh, lots of smiles and laughs and uh, fun, fun new knowledge uh, for our brains. So until next time, adios. Adios. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to Building Scale to help us reach even more people. Please share this episode with a friend, a colleague, or on social media. Remember, the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. And our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. So if you think your company's technology pillar could use some improvement, Book a call with us to see how we can help maximize your IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. And until next time, keep, keep building, building scale. scale. <laughs>